Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the Mad Mamluks. I'm Mahin and I'm joined today by my co-hosts, Summer and Sim. On today's show, we'd like to welcome Nuruddin Knight. Nuruddin Knight is a graduate in psychology from Columbia University with a focus on child and family affairs. She also has studied the Islamic sciences with various mashayikh in both New York City and Amman, Jordan. And she is currently splitting her time between Fez, Morocco and and New York, which I'm sure we'd love to get into because a lot of Fez sounds like such an uh, idealistic place for a lot of Muslims living in America, you know, the original Maghrib and the original West, so to speak. So, Nuruddin, uh, first of all, Jazakallah khair, salam alaikum, for, and w- welcome to the Mad Mamluks. Barakallah thank you for having me, alhamdulillah. I'm so, like, I, I think we had first come, we crossed paths, I think, fairly recently, with a lot of um, our episodes kind of touching upon, which we'll get into in a little bit, um, regarding like spiritual abuse and, you know, or, you know, affairs in the community amongst famous okay. figures. Um, but b- before we get into that, talk to us a little bit about your your own background, um, you know, and your desire for, you know, why you pursue the fields that you have? Okay, so I studied psychology. It was actually somewhat my second choice. I had wanted to study philosophy for a while. And then when I got into college, they happened to not have a philosophy program. So I kind of fell into psychology and then loved psychology and felt like it was a way to still do what I wanted to do philosophy by, philosophy wise, which was just thinking about issues and be make it applicable and be able to help people in real time. And then when it came to Islamic knowledge, once I had finished college, um, I went overseas for a short amount of time, and I was able to spend time with the local shiuk there, and I knew that I wanted to go back and pursue this somewhat long term. I'd, I'd been able to some degree to study in New York, But I wanted to try and be in an environment where I was immersed in Islamic knowledge because I wanted to study the deen better for myself to better understand. And so alhamdulillah, um, after I went to graduate school, then I went back to Jordan for about two years. Um, Yeah, basically to to understand the deen and whenever inshallah ta'ala calls upon me and gives me opportunities then to spread that, that understanding and that knowledge to others. Mashallah, that's really awesome. It sounds like you got a bit of the um, overseas travel bug. It really gets you whenever you get over there. Um, SubhanAllah, it's a totally different feeling because um, I studied abroad just for a little bit, just a tiny bit in Egypt. And it was really similar to how you're saying, you know, you, you realize, wow, there's so much depth and vastness of Islamic knowledge exactly. that can be attained yeah. overseas. And I came back and I haven't been back, able to go back, but definitely always feeling that kind of like gnawing feeling like, oh my gosh, I have to go back. I have to like, if I want true depth or if I want to be able to yeah. get into it in a serious way, it's going to be over there. So mm-hmm. that's awesome that you're able to pursue that. Mashallah. Practically yeah, speaking, right. how, how are okay. you able to manage that between Morocco and New York? Like th- that sounds like a, a real nice uh, ideal <laughs> setup. Like my wife and I have always talked about, I, I've been telling her like we need to move to Medina because my, my wife's a gynecologist and she can pretty much get whatever job she wants there, right? But um, it, it, there's other factors at play, but I think it's something ideal where you can split your time between the United right. States and like a Muslim country would be pretty sweet. I mean, like how does that, how do you manage that? Yeah. I mean, I think I'm, I guess, fortunate or some may say unfortunate in a sense that I I was in school and then I was traveling for a couple of years for two years. So I wasn't locked into any kind of career. So for me, traveling is relatively easy. So it's not as if oh, I have a job that I'm stuck to here or I'm not in school at the moment. So it's not as if I have school that I'm stuck to here that prevents me from going overseas. So I think just for my life in particular, it's somewhat easy. Um, I know that doesn't help you, but it's <laughs> my personal uh, answer. Yeah. Wait. So you're writing for a lot of different blogs as well, right? Um, at, right now, I, I think you're writing for Fig and Olive, and it seems like uh, the MVSLIM blog as well. 
Oh, so I I freelance, right? But my blog is by the fig in the olive dot com, and then I try to freelance as much as possible. Also, so like segue that in that you know into that the stuff we really want to okay. get to. Um, you recently ha- had an article called "A Walk Down Honesty Lane: Consensual <laughs> Illicit Relationships in a Muslim Community." Uh, for the benefit of our listeners and those folks who haven't um, read that article, can you summarize uh, your points in that article? Yeah, so my main point, or let me go through a couple main points. One of the main points in the article was that in a lot of relationships that are being qualified as a victim-predator relationships, the reality is that the relationship is much murkier than that, that it usually isn't just a man completely pursuing a woman that is completely uninterested and then somehow falling into zina or some other kind of non-Islamic relationship, and then so she would be the victim, he's the predator. That usually isn't the case, that a lot of these relationships are murkier than that, and that one of the reasons I believe that we fall into these categorizations is because it's easier. It's easy when you have a clear villain and a clear victim, then it's easier to know how to move forward. You persecute the predator and you support the victim. But when the situations are a bit murkier, I think we don't quite know what to do. Um, and some of the other points I made in the article, so that one of the things that also happens is that a relationship will be blurry. So let's say, for example, that a student is talking to her sheikh or imam, whatever, and they're having, they're creating this emotional relationship. And so somehow they end up getting married in some kind of secret marriage and she bypasses her wali because she really wants to marry this person so that maybe once that secret marriage falls apart then the woman sort of puts on this new lens of maybe in part being hurt by this relationship feeling betrayed whatever it is feeling that maybe she gave up a lot to be with this person and then she kind of changes her point of view so now she's just not a woman who fell in love and got into this relationship that maybe didn't end up being so great, now she categorizes herself as a victim. And one of the issues I see with that is that even though a person of knowledge, we do put more onus on them to be responsible for their actions, there is still a level of knowledge that all of us should have as adult Muslims. We all know that zina is wrong. We all know that as women, for the most part, we should have walis involved in our marriages. So there's still a basic level of knowledge that we are responsible for. But if you only see yourself as a victim, then it's more difficult to learn from your mistakes. So I think so, those are some of the main points that I made. I think one of the things that you brought up was really uh pertinent and maybe even broader than this specific, you know, salacious case that's going on right right now. But Mm -hmm. in general, in our Muslim communities, these consensual relationships are happening, right? And to be able to address those in a really honest way is important, right? And I think you mentioned this in the article, we can't necessarily have it both ways where we say, you know, we are women, we have a voice and we have agency, but then also say, wait a second, I was the victim and this all happened to me or happened with me and I was uh, completely oblivious to it, right? And I think it really, um, it kind of reframed it as, you know, ultimately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take us all to account for whatever we have done, right? So each individual is responsible for whatever they've done. So perhaps a woman who has done this, she will be responsible for it within her scope of her actions. And mm-hmm. if a celebrity shiyu happens, be, happens to be doing this multiple times, then he'll be held for it within that scope, right? Well, I, I want to chime in and play devil's advocate a little bit here. Um there, I could see some scenarios where let's. What if the sister is the is the student, and she's been a student of the sheikh for X amount, and that's like her sheikh, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that what she knows about the dean is from him, and yeah. especially. And I was talking to some brothers who are engaged in like formal tasawwuf, and like they're in, they're in Sufi tariqas, and they say that one thing they always are trying to be cognizant of in general, and they always advise people like if you're going to join the Sufi tariqa, how to make it legit versus being like played by charlatans they mm-hmm. talk about these examples of where the sheikh you know will say something about well i saw you in a dream 
right? And I think we talked a little bit about this. And this came up on the, uh, the, the sh- uh, show with Omar Muzaffar too, that example. Um, and then that's kind of, and he, you're attached already. Cause in some cases, some of these, mm-hmm. especially when those, some of these circles, the, uh, students are, are, are really dependent on the sheikhs. They'll, even from a male's perspective, you know, um, you hear about some sheikh will tell them to divorce their wives or, you know, who to marry, advise them who to marry, et cetera, right? So they're pretty involved. Mm-hmm. So if it's a intergender relationship, um, you know, I think that changes a little bit. What, what are your thoughts on that in, in that specific scenario? Cause I, I want, I want, it sounds like a far, like an isolated scenario, a but in these conversations, what's happening is, People are using these iso- the extreme scenarios as the generalities to prove their overall argument. Um, and I feel like we, sh- we okay. should like at least discuss it. Yeah, this actually came up. My sister and I, Ustada Fatima Knight, who graduated from Zaytuna, we were doing a live stream called Fangirling, where we were basically talking about this whole issue of fangirling or blurred lines and all of that stuff. And so that was actually the question that somebody gave us that what if you're, you feel like you're trapped in a tariqa and whatever the, the situation is that you're being pressured and it could be a circumstance like this. So one of the things that I have come to believe is that it's not really a great idea for women to be involved in a tariqa before getting married. And I wasn't married before I I went into my tariqa. Um, and I don't think that my sheikh is that kind of sheikh. In fact, he's he's against polygamy for his own self and the people in his tariq. Um, however, I think that a lot of the shayu can take advantage of women. So my advice to women would be to get married first. Um, outside of that, it is difficult because when you take a tariq, you're taking an oath to follow this person. So there's, I would say more so general advice about taking a tariq is that be careful who you're following. Follow that person for some time before you actually take the tariq. So I was, I was just reading the, lec- uh, listening to the lectures of my sheikh, reading his books visited in Jordan and saw the students and listened to his lectures and sat with his wife in her lectures before I ever made a decision. So I think that joining a tariq, be careful who you are getting involved with because you are supposed to follow this person once you get involved in the tariq. So I would more so caution someone about the kind of tariq they're joining into because once you're into it, then yes, everybody's going to tell you you should follow the tariq. If the sheikh saw you in a dream, you should marry him in some of these tariqas. So yeah. I I think it's very difficult to deal with when you're in it. So before you get in it, you have to be cautious of who you're following. Why did your sheikh ban polygamy on himself and uh, those individuals who are in, uh, were involved in the tariqa? His, it seems mm-hmm. like it's uh, making something haram on yourself that's permissible. Yeah, and of course I'm not a very, I'm, I'm a big fan of polygamy here. <laughs> okay. the newer, so you're you're getting me a little bit upset. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um yeah, he addressed that that obviously the Sharia doesn't ban polygamy, but for himself and his students in particular, he saw it as a means of zuhud. And when you're mm-hmm. practicing Sufism, you're trying to practice something extra. So for example, you make it an obligation on yourself to do a particular vicar but it's not an obligation in the religion. So it's like you take on extra things that aren't outside of the religion, but are extra than what is obligatory. So for him, it's a means of zuhud that you get married, you're satisfied with that one wife, and that's it. And there have been sheikhs of the past who also advise zuhud in different ways. Like if you've ever read Ghazali, then he talks about eating little, eating plate food, dressing plainly, etc., so this, for for my sheikh, this is about zuhud. So well, well, Sam, I well, think your ma- well, your wife is gonna, you know, direct you to the tariqa, and Mahin probably your look, wife is gonna be like, "Hey guys, I'll, I'll everybody join this one." I'm I'll, a one woman kind of guy, anyways. Look, <laughs> all of us guys who are involved in knowledge, everyone knows from MSA days. Okay, they know that when you're killing it on the MSA khatib circuit, you know. You, you have sisters all around you. They're talking to you and they're, they're just feeding into your ego and your, your, your head can't walk through the door 
But and that's uh, just at the MSA level. Yeah. So imagine what it, what it's yeah. like, you know, being, uh, you know, the head of a tariqa or whatever, you know. Or head yeah, of a platform exactly. that you it create. It goes both ways. Team. That there is pressure sometimes for the students in those tariqa that the sheikh may want to marry them and they don't see a way out of that if they're not interested. And there's also probably more pressure on the sheikh who has all of these women who are focused on him, who may love him and then end up loving him in a romantic way and want to marry him. So there's issues on both sides for sure. Look, look, when when a guy is uh, talking after his khutbah and there's like sisters around him, they're looking mm-hmm. at him with like doughy eyes and like... <laughs> all this reverence he, of yeah. like, mashallah, tabarakallah, you yeah. just like yeah. moved my heart and my soul and you made me closer to Allah, therefore... Yeah. You know, if I get close to you, that's going to be a constant like ajr and you know. Well, you, um, you just know, system. like I'm telling you from a guy's head, okay? And I don't care how many guys deny this; they know that that look when a woman gives you those doughy eyes, they know like they have her, and it's just, it's just something that is in the back of a, a man's psychology that okay. um, they know that at that point uh, they can have their way with whatever they want to say you know they yeah i actually have they to give basically a... primed right. the person to go ahead and infiltrate right to move from all right you're you've been a listener in my audience now i'm going to bring you into my inner circle and that's really where i kind of wanted to go with this as well is that all right as a msa khatib or as a khatib that speaks at local masajid or the head of a tariqa or any of these imams and shuyukh and people who have been given a platform honestly through the public, right? We've been the people who have subscribed to their channel or listened to their videos or gone to their talks whenever they speak in like these filled rooms. We're the ones who did that, right? We're the ones who built this platform for them. And yet there was n- there's no um, accountability or ethical body to kind of clear them, mm-hmm. right? Like I'm a teacher by profession. And yeah. so as a teacher, I have ethics class. I have a whole certification of licensure that says, hey, I know how to interact with my students. And if I ever cross that line, my licensure will be taken away. So my livelihood depends on my ethical behavior. And we have that for lawyers, for doctors, right? They have patient client privilege and they have, you know, uh, client lawyer privilege. So all of these things, it's like training that's built into their career. And I feel like that's where this conversation needs to go as a whole, as an ummah, right? Not just yeah. the podcast, but also as an ummah, we need to be thinking about, all right, anyone who's given a platform, if you're invited to Isna or if you're invited to my local masjid or if you're invited anywhere and have yeah. access to my public, I know you've had ethical training and that's why I'll uh, Ahmad Sheikh has a, had a great article about this on Muslim Matters where he was talking about how every profession had a uh like for example lawyers had a, a bar association where there's like elders involved and whatnot and i think uh they grill you yeah. they grill you they ask for recommendations they have people write letters about your character not yeah. even like your academics they hold right? you to account and yeah absolutely when you mess up they'll 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 take the appropriate action that's necessary and it doesn't become what what's become right now a big circus show right well, well, even like universities, like University yeah. of Medina or wherever, wherever people are studying, do they have an ex- ethics class? I mean, from what I've kind of gleaned, putting you know, the radar out there, it doesn't seem like there's an ethics class on how to interact with the populace that you're serving. Yeah. You know, so it should really start from those universities and places that are churning out the shiuch and the imams and all those things. Well, Stada, is it possible with all the different rivalries that we have uh, in the Muslim community just uh, whether it's theological rivalries or even political rivalries, do you mm-hmm. think this is possible that, that we could have um, uh, a, a governing body that can uh, you know, resolve these type of issues? I, as much as I understand why people would think that's a good idea, I don't think it's possible because we're not united enough. These are really these are independent public speakers. So if we're going to have a governing body, then these people would have to freely submit to those governing bodies. And and why would they do that? Now, I think I think maybe it's possible sort of now that I'm thinking about it, maybe it's possible if you've got enough people on board, like if you've got the shiuk themselves on board to sign whatever it was to give power to this organization to 
I don't know, and investigate or have rules or whatever it is, then maybe it's possible, but it's just how do you get enough people on board and then how do you get people to actually listen and listen to those people in authority? Because it's it's their free will. They don't have to. So um I think it's difficult. These are all independent speakers. I like we know the the Muslim Matters article or what was it? A letter that was signed by a couple of people saying that yes, Nuan Ali Khan did wrong things, whatever that, that article said. Um but it's like if I don't like those particular shayuk, not me personally, but if anyone doesn't like those particular shayuk, they can say, well, I like Numan Ali Khan. I don't like those people, so I'm going to follow Numan Ali Khan. Right. So it's very, it's difficult to do in our society. Um, you would just really have to get enough people on board with that, enough powerful, yeah. well-liked people to, to agree to that. I think even like public pressure of the average person can play a really big role here. You know, whenever I see this all unfolding on Facebook, it's not good for my iman. It's not good for me as a Muslim to just see it all unraveling on Facebook without having any kind of clarity, any kind of direction, just yeah. as an average Muslim, right? Um, and so I really feel like, okay, maybe initially the Muslim community was really just like raw and immature and didn't like, they really just needed academics and they needed people who were solid in their scholarly foundation. But now the Muslim community is kind of developed to the point where we need institutionalizing of certain uh, things, right? Like this judiciary body that can say, okay, these people have gone through ethical training and they are the ones that ISNA will invite or ICNA will invite or, you know, all these different conferences will invite to be a speaker. And that's how you know you want to invite those people into your masajid, into your local community, right? And whenever you have that public pressure saying that, no, we're not going to invite people who haven't been cleared through our ethics or this particular national ethics committee, whatever it might be, um, then that person is not going to be given a platform. And I think that has to be something that as a public, mm -hmm. as an ummah, we have to start demanding, right? That leadership needs to be there to say, we're going to stop focusing on just this one particular issue and act like this is the only instance of secret marriage that has happened in our community. I mean, in Chicago alone, gosh, like it's what October now since January, I've heard of at least five or six secret marriages. And we have institutions mm -hmm. that are encouraging secret marriages. Oh, you know what? Don't worry. Your first wife will be mad, but then she'll get over it because guess what? She doesn't have any other options. Like that blew my <laughs> that mind. True, right? Well, yeah. that blew my mind that that's how you want that family dynamic to happen. Well, and like is, this happened in our okay, community. Let's, let's just, okay. And it literally okay, okay, okay. explodes, <laughs> right? It does not go how that particular uh, can, can leader we had advised Can we segue them. real quick? <laughs> let's, let, 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 okay. let. <laughs> Sorry, I got really into that. All right. So just, like... <laughs> So if there's a, I mean, let's say I, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> wait, how was it? Wait, come on. How how many? To be fair, for the guys, I, I don't right? know. I don't. Know, none of my friends got secret marriages. Look, and I know a lot of people. They're secret. That's what people <laughs> don't know about them. <laughs> okay, so they're not that secret either, because you see these families implode. Right. To say that the first wife doesn't have options, and then to watch that marriage deteriorate. Yeah. You know, but then, you're not making the Muslim community stronger by any means. By but how many women this. are even willing to budge about uh, having a second wife? You know, so well, you know what the second wife thing. I honestly, and I think we've talked about this before. Maybe it wasn't on a podcast, but we've talked about this before. If men who feel like they need a second wife put in half the effort into their first marriage that they do in finding and recruiting and proposing to this second one, yeah, their first marriage would be a hundred times th stronger. Those are nice sayings and everything, but look, <laughs> there's a lot of guys who just, they're, for whatever reason, they, they're not getting what they need from their first marriage. I don't think that's that, it at that, all. I have a very hard time well, believing why, why, that they're well, not. Well, what, what if something like, I feel well, like, let's just say that they want a different face. Like, like, like they want a every, flavor. Like, I, I, I need a Desi wife, I need a convert wife, I need a Latino wife, and an Arab wife. But, yeah. dude, the problem, bro, the problem is, is they're not taking care of any of them. They're not taking care of the what first they, what wife they are? financially or emotionally. Or there's let's like just, definitely just a what lack. What if you're loaded? Like, I, I've, got a, I've got a friend. Um, then be up front with your wife. Yeah. Be, if you're man enough to have a second wife, be man enough to talk to your first wife. Uh, I, 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 I agree. I you know? agree. The, like, the secret marriage setup is. Have respect for her. I, I do feel a secret marriage setup. I was talking to a, like, so one of my. Uh, one of one of my teachers, he told me how he got his second wife. He he told 
her before. She wasn't on board. They had a meet too. You know what I mean? They they met and everything. And I asked them. I remember asking them like, so uh, was she excited? I was like, you know, she wasn't. She's not excited about it. But you know, she's you know, I I told her in advance. You know that this, I was, and she's known for a while that I was interested, right, in finding a second wife. Um, and I was like, do you think that's like the typical? I'm like, the fact that she's okay with it, like, is not, but not excited. Is like the ideal scenario. It's look, you know I, what I mean? look. I think as much as I'm, I joke about having a second wife and everything, I think it's very unrealistic in this day and age. I think if you want a second wife, just and, and there's no way that your first wife is not living up to your needs, just go with a divorce. That's I think that's the only option that uh, will. Make every, you mean every, if the first marriage is so unfulfilling and so problematic, yeah. then it might be better to just exactly. divorce than to drag it out like yeah. that. Thank I'm, you. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, but honestly, you know, my advice for anyone who is seeking polygamy or wants a second wife and their first wife is so anti, the best thing that a guy can do is love your first wife and make her feel so secure in how much you care for her and how much you take care of her. That's what's going to bring her around to yeah. feeling like she could even benefit from a second wife relationship. Because I have friends who have, who are in a multiple, you know, relationship and they benefit from the second wife as a deep loving relationship. That's so they great. don't that's feel no like way. it's competitive. There's no way that's, that's realistically possible with, uh, it's, um, they're real people. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying, saying they don't fight or they don't I'm have any like, you know, well, 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 what's the saying is that he and I are douchebags and we can't do that. <laughs> there's, there's no- <laughs> Let's just be honest. Like, I, I'm, t- I gotta go, uh, the, watch the, a fo- there's a foot, there's f- like, there's college football Saturday every fall. That's like 10 hours of my day gone, right? So then you gotta pick, right? Yeah, right. Have you ever watched Sister Wives? Right? That dude does nothing. <laughs> All he does is spend time with his wives. So yeah. if you don't like spending time with one wife, believe yeah, yeah. me, you're so, not. So that, that's why. Know, he doesn't do golf. He doesn't yeah. play basketball. It's like you gotta give up everything else. Yeah. So. Right. I, I think the one thing I, and I think we talked about this offline well, I, before, is that, um, Sometimes there are some, nothing justifies like illicit relationships, but the reality is what's happening is that a lot of people, a lot of guys are saying, well, I'm not going to get a second wife or second whatever. I'm just going to have a fling on the side. Yeah. And then that will satisfy me and then I'll give it up and there's no strings attached. And yeah. sometimes you got people involved where the other side is like you have got a, you got a sister who feels the same way, like, yeah, my husband isn't fulfilling me and I, I'm it's no strings attached, so it just it's just a match made in heaven or hell, so to speak. Yeah. Whatever but like so so that's another reality that's happening. We're not here justifying it. I know some of the our haters are gonna be like Mad Mum Luke's are encouraging affairs. So no. I'm just calling you all out right now that we're not. we're not. But I'm just saying that's the reality yeah. that's happening is that, you know, you oh, know or or, or sh- Ustad and Noura, do yeah. you see that a lot? I know you do family counseling mm-hmm. and child psychology. Do you see illicit affairs being like a really big problem within the Muslim community? Or what are what are the problems that you do end up seeing a lot? The problems that I've seen thus far, I haven't seen any situation with illicit relationships, but I've seen secret marriages. And um, it was interesting. There was one case of a sister who her husband, she knew he had a second wife and they married when... She was already older. She couldn't have kids, so she was fine with him having a second wife. But she didn't want him to get another wife after that. And then he ended up getting a second and, excuse me, a third and a fourth wife. Um, And she didn't know about this until he passed. So we were dealing with her, her pain of both missing him after his death, as well as finding out he kept this huge secret from her of two other wives and Whoa. other children. Subhanallah. So uh, our work with her was to to help her forgive him. And I think had he been alive and she found this out, it would be a different scenario. There'd, more, there'd be more work we'd have to do with both of them. But obviously he passed, so it was better to forgive him. Um, I think that as Muslim women, we have to realize, especially Muslim women in the West, that as much as we may naturally dislike polygamy because of our culture, we don't want to demonize it to the point where we actually almost drive men to either have secret marriages 
or to commit zina because they think, well, if I either if I openly try to engage in polygamy, well, my wife is going to leave me. I love my wife. I don't want her to leave me. So I'm going to do something on the low. So I feel like for us as Muslim women, we also have to be careful of that, too, of not demonizing it so much that men would prefer to either um, engage in haram or engage in, in secrecy. So there, there does have to be that conversation with us as women of, okay, maybe we don't like it, but is there some way in which we can accept it? And that, that's not an easy conversation because it's so far into our culture. Sure. Um, in terms of what I've seen just in the Muslim community, I mean, we've dealt with women who have faced domestic violence um, and sort of the, in the vein of sort of spiritual abuse, and there have been cases where men will twist the Quran or twist Hadith in a way that will support their abuse of their wives. Mm -hmm. And so that's something we've seen as well. And I don't know if I wrote it in this article or if it's something I'm writing now, I don't remember. But it's really important for women to not solely rely either on their husbands or on one shayuk for knowledge. That knowledge, especially when you're starting out for me, I found that it was beneficial to go to many shayuk at first, especially to see, okay, what is common in the religion and what are some outlier things and what are just some shayuk's opinions so that I can know what is actually the truth of our religion. And so I'm, and then later on, I, I started studying with fewer shayuk and I'm comfortable with the shayuk that I have now. So I think it's important for us to seek knowledge on our own and not to depend on just one man, whether that be our husband or a ship, because then it's very easy to be taken advantage of. It's very easy for that spiritual abuse to happen. Sure. Now, you mentioned that, like, women in general, we need to be more open to the idea of polygamy, you know, just so That's that we can happen. be I mean, a little bit more... <laughs> <laughs> That's never going to happen. That's never going to happen. Well, so I feel like it can be too pronged, right? Like, for on the one hand, whenever I have conversations with my girlfriends about polygamy and kind of like all these secret marriages going on, some of them mm-hmm. feel just so romantically in love with their husbands uh, that that yeah. jealousy would prevent them from doing that. But on the other okay. hand, yeah. you know, and I mean, that's a very real emotion that that can happen, mm-hmm. right? Someone can be so in love with their husband. It's possible. For sure, but, yeah. um, on you the say other that in hand, jest almost. <laughs> which I'll, I'll get to. Little, I want you to. I want a little you to bit of sarcasm going. there, but just a little. And then on the other hand, you know, you'll have women who are very objective. They can look at their husband and be like, man, this guy is barely handling me <laughs> and all, all of my emotional ups and downs and all right. of the energy, you know, psychological, emotional, financial hustle energy that it takes to handle me. This dude mm-hmm. will not be able to handle another. And so I really feel yeah. like if. A, a, if a guy can prove to his first wife that he can handle her and she can give a recommendation like, OK, he's actually going to be able to take care of someone else. That's huge. Right. Yeah. Because she is the best assessor of what kind of husband he is and what kind of father he is right. to to go on and do that with anybody else, you know, and to and that emotional um, kind of roller coaster if if a guy is having trouble handling that with one wife, then definitely two just adds to the loops and the turns of that. Um, but so I was going to ask you, so it seems like, you know, a lot of people are either turning to polygamy or divorce whenever they have this dissatisfaction in their marriage. What kind right. of advice can you give us that kind of steers away from these two paths? Because they're both pretty, you know pretty extreme almost and then you have this whole chunk of people that are kind of in these unhappy unfulfilling marriages that are looking for a way out so what kind of advice can you give us to before you say that, i don't think it's fair to call polygamy extreme okay. it's, it is part of the sunnah okay. yeah, of course <laughs> I, I, I mean, wise, yes no but, but no i i see what you're saying and i actually agree with a lot what summer said but i want to hear uh yeah, i, your, your I agree as well but the problem is is that when you look the, the way you framing it it's making the male seem like okay well yeah you're let's just pretend that you know my, my wife is just telling me that straight up to my face what summer just said right well to me it seems like well oh well yeah maybe she's right maybe the only alternative for me is to do something haram like zina you know you, you know what i'm saying like right. if, if you like degrade whoever or whatever i am and all my accomplishments to the point that 
you know, you make me feel like um, I'm barely handling you. You're making, you're shaping my psyche and my options, the options available to me uh, towards Zina. And I think that's, that's also. I meant that, that as that, an encouragement. Yeah. I meant that as like, you yeah. handle your stuff, bro. She's going to be like, yeah, this guy's got it under control. Definitely not as a degrading. <laughs> so as I, upgrade. I, I, I actually want to chime in real quick. Um, so first of all, uh, we talked a little about a, so the great Sheikh Muhammad Sayyid Adli has a great quote where um, some sisters asked them about like her, their husbands, you know, and dealing with fitting outside. And he was like, you must be greater fitness for him in the house. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that's one thing. But like, I, the, I think Summer's kind of alluding to a point. I don't know. I don't know if she actually said it is that as Muslims, I don't think we're taught how to, I don't know that we know how to love our spouses. I think it's just like a random thing that we're just like, cause here, I, I talk to like, I have a lot of non-Muslim coworkers. We talk very frankly, right? And there's certain things I've noticed about how they interact with their spouses. And, you know, I'm not saying to justify dating, but they got practice. They practiced since they were like 13 years old, being in relationships, being some bad ones, some good ones. Um, and we just kind of fall into this like, and for us, it's all like, oh, that's just a thing to do. And, to be honest, some of us saw our parents living like pretty, like you know, very prudish, yeah, office. right. Yeah. Mm. And so we're not seeing the best example. And then the only, and then there's these false images of like what you see in the movies of everything Overly being Id- romanticized, right? Like, exactly. Is a so gesture. then you, once you, and then you, when you get married, you're running on the honeymoon phase, right? On that, on that, but then that oil runs out. And then you actually got to put in work like to love somebody is an active verb, right? That you have to yeah. take effort. And sometimes you might realize your marriage is in the gutter like five, ten years in. And that point, it's like really hard to like to you. It's still possible, right? But I think people are like, I don't see how I could do it or I'm repulsed by my spouse for whatever reason. And then that's yeah. why you have that, di- that that dilemma. But I think it's almost like, you know, we just don't know how to be married almost. I, I think that's the root cause. And that's why there's dissatisfaction. And when the cute secretary at work is down to have a fling, you know, no strings attached, that's what some guys will go for. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. I think you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, I wanted to make a point about, um, yeah, about, honesty and sort of coming into a marriage with honesty so that and and within a marriage with honesty so if a man knows that he wants another woman another woman yeah then he should make that clear to his wife and I think that if he like if he really feels like if he doesn't get a second wife he's going to commit zina he should marry a second wife and he should be upfront with his with his wife that this is what he's going to do and uh, the woman can accept that. She cannot accept it. But there has to be some honesty from the man. And the man should remember that he's the leader in the marriage. If that's what he's going to do, he doesn't allow himself to fall into sin. He has to say, hey, this is this is a part of our religion. This is something that I want to do. This is what I'm going to do. And then she can obviously make her own decision. And I think for us as women, what we have to understand this is you know people can feel free to disagree with me but I really feel like from what I've sort of read and listened to that men they're not the same as women that they can love a woman they can be in love with their wife she's perfect she's everything and still want to be with another woman they can really just feel like that's That's just who they are that's their personality they want more than one woman in their life they want more than one wife that's understandable and and i feel like a lot of women do understand that men are capable of that but whenever a first wife doesn't see that love or she's not you know she doesn't feel valued she doesn't feel loved to begin with then it will feel hard for her that oh he's capable of loving me and someone else when she's not seeing that initially Right? right. So if but men it, are yeah, capable of that, they need to. The... Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to talk over no, you, no. but yeah, they just if <laughs> if they really are capable, right? If their heart and their mind and their actions are capable of demonstrating love to more than one person, then they have to put in the work to show it to that first person. And I think your point about honesty is 
completely like hit the nail on the head that's exactly what needs to happen right like Mm -hmm. if if that's where the marriage is going but so even backtracking from that so what are some other you know ways that people can figure out what's going on within their marriage right because Mm -hmm. most people who are looking into a second marriage are not super happy and fulfilled and satiated with their first there's definitely issues going on there So what kind of advice do we, do you have for, yeah, what kind of advice do you have for, for, um, you know, I, I would say honestly, the average Muslim marriage right now. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that we have to realize that we have real agency and I, I feel like that's kind of a theme that I'm writing about a lot, but just realizing that we have real agency, like no marriage in general, maybe there are exceptions, but no marriage in general is just bad or just good. There are usually people working within that marriage and that often one person can change the entire marriage. So there, there are books like, um, I feel like there's a book called How the Two of Us Can Make the One of Us whole something no how the one of us can make the two of us whole something like that um there's another book called fascinating womanhood that focuses just on the woman so as a woman that's what i'm usually reading about trying to focus on that you can change your marriage it's not just a bad marriage it's bad because of the action or lack of actions that are happening in it so whether that is paying more attention to your spouse, being more interested in them, dressing nicely in the house, asking them what they want and trying to do it, whatever it is. And that goes for both the man and the woman, that oftentimes we're just actively not doing anything to make the marriage better. And we magically think that we're supposed to be in love. The marriage is just supposed to be great. If there are two people who love each other, they should just have a happy marriage. And it really, I'm sure those of us who are married know that it really isn't like that. You have to work on it or it can just die naturally. And so I think that men and women, but as a woman, I'll particularly speak to women, that you have to seek out specific ways that you can make your marriage better. You have to stay in tuned with your marriage and what's going on with your husband and what makes him happy and what you can do to make it better, that you have full agency to make the marriage better, finding out what that is, whether that's seminars or books or asking your grandmother or asking, especially women who come from traditional cultures, asking them what they do. That There's so many things that if we make an effort, we can change our marriage for the better. I definitely think you hit a really great point about staying in tune with the marriage. Yeah. Um, just a little personal blip, but I married a football quarterback kind of like always in his head silent type mashallah tabarakallah great guy but not a big talker not really in tune with his emotions but you know starting off i was very just like verbal and very like okay this is all my emotional baggage here you go we have to deal with it together this is who i am this is what we have to do and then kind of even prying out his own emotions right because I mean, men are not even conditioned to talk that much or to deal with their emotions that much, to feel, honestly, to feel their own emotions sometimes. And Mm -hmm. now, alhamdulillah, I've got two boys and we're just Mm -hmm. always trying to make them cognizant of, all right, what's going on inside? And Mm -hmm. let's figure out a way to verbalize that and express that and let your family know how you're feeling and what's going on without judgment right like because everyone's going to feel angry or jealous or something at some point and what we as muslims need to do is work on our like actions towards those All things right, okay. but we're allowed to have those feelings a so, lot of guys you guys a lot of women say that right and then when the guy verbalizes what he actually wants from his wife they get upset like and they say you know you hurt my feelings i can't what did you ask them that i'm <laughs> you know, curious I, I consider myself in my in my in my marriage. I'm the emotional one. Well, that's good. Yeah. You know, like, I, 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 I'm the one. Yeah, that's I know, like but, but, but you know. let's just say Self-aware. you know, yeah. like like someone was saying that you know, men don't verbalize what their issues are, and what when we Sometimes, do, yeah. uh, women aren't receptive to it. And you know, oh, what kind of advice would you give sisters uh, about you know being more receptive to uh, some of the issues that uh, a man needs uh, that. Uh, 
that she's not addressing in the marriage, that the wife isn't addressing in the marriage. Right. I think I heard somewhere say of something about accepting me or something like that. Here's all my emotional stuff, accept me. And not to talk about emotions in particular, but I think that for some reason, <laughs> as American women, we have this idea that, well, people, individuals in general, as American society, we have this idea, but then women in particular in our marriage, we have this idea that our husband should accept us no matter what. And it's a really strange idea when you think about it, because <laughs> to say that your husband should just be happy if you're overweight, he should be happy if you don't look particularly nice, he should be happy if you can't cook, is pretty bizarre. You're asking someone to be happy about things that don't make them happy. So I think we have to get out of this mindset that people should accept us as we are with all our flaws. Because even as Muslims, we're supposed to be striving to do better. You're not who you are is not someone who likes to wear lounge clothes around the house. That's not who you are. That's just something that you do. So if it's not particularly pleasant to your husband and you like like you said, if you specifically ask your husband particularly, what would be nice for you if I wore it? He says something and then you're like, oh, my God, how could you not accept me for who I am? Well, that you're not working, actively working on your marriage or even actively working to make yourself a better person. So I think both for men and women, I, I just happen to be focusing on women, but for both men and women to realize that, no, it's not okay to simply say, accept me as I am. That's not fair to the other person, that we have to be working towards our better selves. And if we can tweak things that, you know, aren't haram, don't go against like the core of our being, that are just small things, um, or even big things, but still not things that harm us in any way, that we have to try to do it, to actively try to make the other person happy, inshallah ta'ala, and to do it for the sake of Allah. I absolutely think you're correct about, you know, molding and growing into each other. But mm -hmm. kind of my point there was that um, to be able to share those vulnerabilities that I had when yeah, we had yeah. initially gotten married and then to be open to, OK, this is basically what we're dealing with so that your spouse has a clear picture of where you're coming from. And then like Sim was saying that, you know, if the wife is not open to it, it's really about I feel like establishing this open and honest conversation about, you know, I'm not going to come from any kind of feministic perspective and judge your request. Yeah. I'm not going to say, oh, yeah. you know, all of a sudden, if you if you asked for blonde hair, I'm just making this up, yeah. you know, and come at it with like, hey, how come you like blonde hair? And like, you, that's so <laughs> Western or whatever superiority yeah. complex or whatever. But to take that and like to understand, okay, this is where he's coming from. So that having that open vulnerability is really important without yeah. that judgment. So that's my two cents. I think it's also like you can't waiting until your spouse screws up and like yelling at them isn't like open communication. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You, yeah. There's got to be it's like casual stuff. But sometimes it's like it's like my wife and I always disagree on what constitutes like proper menswear. Like, I've told her from the get-go, like, even before we were recording, I would tell her, like, that freaking ugly turban hat that they wear at the wrist at the, at the wedding, I ain't wearing that. That's freaking ugly as hell. <laughs> and, like, I, and I don't expect you to, like, know anything about men's fashion, because I don't know anything about women's fashion, right? So, like, I'm not going to, like, I, I disagree with that whole night. And so, we, 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 we go back and forth about that, right? And she, her being from Mississippi, I'm sure Summer can relate. She's always about like, oh, you gotta wear that southern preppy look with the, uh, shaggy hair for, you know, that. The Justin Bieber, like, yeah, right, right, doing. right. Not like, cause like people like, my barber cuts my hair. I, I got a barber and he's always like, your wife will love this haircut. Well, no, she won't. <laughs> like it's always she, she you know if, if I look like Eli Manning yeah back when he was an old Miss <laughs> yeah. that would probably work but but not this like you know side part pompadour or whatever that I got going on you so know. then is that is that a double standard like she should be okay with looking how you prefer but you're not okay with looking how she prefers I don't care what she wears to be honest and as I long think as it's halal. That, that, <laughs> that, that matters more, not necessarily like in that very reciprocal way, but if it matters a lot to one spouse, like we have this rating right. system. If uh, my husband and I are arguing about something and then we'll pause for a second, like, okay, on a scale of one to 10, how important is this for you? 
right? And if it's a two <laughs> for me, which means I really don't care that much about it, but he's like, no, it's super important to me Wait, tonight you, that you we have... You guys actually have a rating system? Yeah. He, Holy it's cow, like, I got to bring this up to him. It's a, it's, If he's like, this is a nine for me, right? Which means like it's really important that he has wings that night. By so the I'm way, like, for, okay, we'll for, the, for the listeners who don't know, Summer is my sister-in-law and my brother is married to her so it just oh, helps cut definitely. down arguments so quickly because then we know like okay this is like super high on someone else's radar and it matters so mm-hmm. much to them i'm gonna go ahead and like and and it builds in that honesty and that vulnerability because i'm gonna always rate things honestly and vice versa so that i know i've got that like i've built his trust i i, I agree with like we kind of figured you saw you figure it out like my wife i remember when i started like buying like a massive amount of sneakers I asked her in advance. I was like, because she was like, you needed a hobby. So I watched this documentary on Netflix about like sneakerheads. And I was like, this is what I'm going to do. And she said, no. I was like, I meant something productive, like woodworking or something like that, or craft or shop. <laughs> and then I went ahead and then just started. I, 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 you know, I just started. And then like, at the beginning, she was just like really pissed off. And then I guess she just got used to it. Now we were talking like, like a month ago and. You know, she still thinks I'm. Obs- I was like, I actually ain't as obsessed as I used to be. Like, I haven't. I don't think I bought a pair of shoes in like probably like two months, maybe. But yeah. whereas before, it was like, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna like put myself out there. But <laughs> like, oh well, one of my teachers just called me out on a, on, his, on a lecture about the the volume I was buying. In it, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm glad he did. I don't I, think I, that I, that should... qualifies as zuhud. You I, I actually be. texted him. I actually texted him saying like I actually bought more than you quoted me as. Oh my god! Oh, wow. <laughs> it's like you need to like go back and edit the show notes, <laughs> so you provide the accurate representation of my what I did in my heyday. But uh, you know, I I think that's the uh um uh, that th- that's I like the grading system. I I think sometimes we need systems like that to like get stuff get stuff done. Otherwise, we have a, it just gets ignored. KPI reports for <laughs> for our marriage. No, but like at work we do. No, here's the thing. Like so there's this thing called like a task share list. Cosi, I think it is, an mm-hmm. app. So like if my wife expects me to like, you know, do like vacuuming like uh for guests coming over, right? If I know like a week in advance I got a week to do this versus like let, drop dead last second, you know, pilot it all on, you know, but in her head, she assumed that I would have known the vacuum. If it's on a list that we can communicate, that we have, we have documented, then that just makes things. Like, Do you guys I, use the task list right now? Um, no, I have not been able to download the app for some reason. Okay. You know, I really yeah. think there's a lot that we can learn from like the business world, and I feel like each family is almost like a little mini company or an empire that you're building, right? And you and your spouse are the CEOs of that company. And if you have to have these built-in systems and routines to make things hum along, then why not? And I know that like men and women communicate differently. So it's really important to kind of tweak that and figure out, okay, hey, if a rating system, which I know it sounds like weird, like, oh, one is 10, what is that, you know? But if it really helps cut down on your arguments and just clarifies your own intention with your spouse, then See, as, as guys, a lot of us, we just hate drama and we'd rather oh, yeah, not even down so much. We, we, if we end up exposing something that really bothers us and something that you're not willing to change as a, as a woman, as a wife, then it turns out, it turns out to be a big mess, right? And it well, turns out to be drama and we don't want to avoid drama. So we'll end up lying on those little rating systems and say <laughs> yeah, stuff that you're already good at and yeah. we'll say hey and, and the only thing else give Sim, it a try give Sim it a try credit and be honest he, he's a veteran he's, he got like 15 years of marriage or yeah. 16 That's true. Yeah. something like that I used to, <laughs> I used to oh, give the the young ones who were getting advice or who were getting married a lot of wedding advice and, yes uh, Summer Summer and I have been in the game about the same amount she's got a few months on me yeah about 8 years now yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. But but I think so a business only has one CEO, not two. <laughs> well, CEO, <laughs> I just, I just like, CFO, yeah. I mean I, I don't know, I don't want to put it out there like cuz like these are little subtle drops that you're like put, l- bombs you're just <laughs> dropping in yeah. that I have to address otherwise I'm glad we'll, you're not letting her. <laughs> you well, know what I mean? You know again, like you're building this empire, you're building this legacy, you're building a family and obviously you're going to have different roles. But at the same time, if you can hold each other accountable and you can hold each other to that responsibility that like we're both working toward making this family a a better company or this, you know, this better entity, 
then that works so much better than just being like, oh, she's my minion that's going to run around and do all the chores and have the children. And, you know, like having those really um, traditional roles, it doesn't just it doesn't mesh anymore in a lot of in a lot of marriages. It doesn't work. Well, so. um, it's funny you, you mentioned the business because I remember my wife and I were talking like, I don't know, a year or two ago, you know, with only one kid. We we're just like and I was like, I feel like all we talk about now is just like chores has to get done or where we're going here and et cetera, et cetera. And it's like running an operation. And I think that if you look at it like a business perspective, you sometimes do take the human element out of it in some mm-hmm. ways. Because at work, at the end of the day, like, you know, it's all about like getting them results, making that, for me, it's like making that steel and like <laughs> selling to Toyota, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And, and, and if push comes to shove, like I might have a good relationship with a coworker, but the bottom line is the bottom line. And you gotta, when you gotta cut heads, you gotta cut heads. Right, you gotta be a little cutthroat about. It. So I think that sometimes I'd, I'd be careful about it because I I know in my marriage at one point I felt like it's an operation and I was like I didn't like that because that emotional element was out of it. You gotta bring that in with like date right. nights and yeah, just like I don't know. Yeah, you're right. You're right. It can get too businessy and you gotta make sure to reel that back in and balance it. Right. Osada, what do you think of our little <laughs> our rating system and <laughs> business um, perspective? I think it's. I think if you can do it, it's great. Um, I don't know how many people can, like in the heat of an argument, but I think it's a great idea. Um, what was the other thing about the business model? Yeah, there? she was like, you know, running it like Summer was like, if you think of your family unit like a corporation, you know, like the husband <laughs> could be the CEO and then the wife would be the COO or something. And then the kids will be like, you know, the minions, the, the min- basically <laughs> right. The union laborers, <laughs> the janitors. <laughs> uh, you know, I think if it works, if that works for some people, then it works. Um, yeah, but I definitely get what someone else said about uh, then it can become kind of cool if you're more so focused on getting things done. So it's interesting. And I also I also notice people these days will call their spouse their partner, um, which also kind of comes from the business world. And I feel a bit weird about, but mm-hmm. I guess if it works for people, then it works. Um yeah, I don't know. I guess I don't have a personal opinion about that one. Sure. Okay. And I think that that's really awesome because you're right. Each person is different, right? Like what might work for my, me and my husband would totally be like, no way. It's not going to fly in a different marriage mm-hmm. and and maybe not even fly with the kids. Right. So it just kind of depends. And I think that's the biggest thing that I've been able to take away is that be ready to be open and figure out what works. Right. Like if you try something mm-hmm. and it doesn't work, be ready to pivot. And be ready to try something else. All right. Let's make a shift yeah. here into yeah. the last thing we want to talk about, which is the social media uh, hashtag campaign, hashtag oh, uh, me too. Uh, Ustad Nuruddin, what's your assessment of, can you just, anyone who's not on Facebook or not on social media, or, um, <laughs> hopefully there's not our listeners, right. but can you just explain <laughs> what, what, what do you, what's your assessment overall of, of this campaign? What's it about? And like, what are your thoughts on it? My assessment of the campaign is that it's basically trying to bring awareness to sexual harassment and I think the magnitude of it. Uh, I was recently having a discussion with someone about the campaign because um, Daniel Hakikaju, he wrote an article about the Me Too campaign, so people were discussing it. And I felt like the the Me Too campaign in its just overarching goal of bringing awareness to sexual harassment is a good thing. Um, Often, just from a psychology perspective, often people who do face sexual assault, they feel ashamed. And so they don't talk about what has happened to them because they feel some kind of association with almost with the perpetrator, as if they had some part in it. They feel shame, and they also have to face society who may judge them, who may tell them that maybe they're lying, or maybe that's what they wanted, or maybe they did the wrong thing and they deserved it, etc. And so it's one of those crimes, I think, that goes most unreported. And so for me, I don't see an issue with it. I think it's a good thing, and I really have been 
thinking about how do we get people to not feel ashamed of being sexually abused? Is it something inherent about that action that makes people feel that shame that they don't want to come forward? Is it something our society is doing wrong? But there has to be a way for people to know that they should not feel blame when they are abused and that however we can get people to come out and and uh, report these people who are perpetrating these crimes as quickly as possible is good for society and stops it from from continuing to happen. So Right. So one thing is I heard some folks yeah. were about the campaign, but I thought the I heard the original campaign included men and then yeah. they were removed from that dynamic mm-hmm. so to speak as if like men aren't being sexually harassed i was sexually harassed okay. in sixth grade i'm not going to tell you the details because I, I don't know how unfiltered you are but it was pretty graphic and i'll tell these guys offline <laughs> well i've i've had like women uh at work like grab my shoulders and i i i, I felt a little bit weird about it and but Ooh. as as guys we were supposed to kind of you know all right did, oh, you can be accepting of it cam- you know i think the me too campaign is a little bit more serious than someone grabbing shoulders. Do, okay, do, do you want like my, my yeah. like mine? I, yeah, grabbing shoulders. Is, I'm talking about if uh, if I did that to a girl, I'd be in jail like the next day. What grabbing a shoulder? No, I'm saying like oh, what happened, what happened to, to me in sixth grade? Oh, I'm not traumatized by it or nothing, yeah. but like mm. I, I just remembered it this week. Well, I yeah. think inclusiveness yeah. of yeah. men's voices it is important because it does happen to young men. It happens to men and women both. But I think overwhelmingly it's happening to women. And I was, uh, you know, because of all this awareness, some uh, there were statistics that out of a thousand sexual assault cases, only one perpetrator actually goes to jail for it. And oh, only only six of them, I believe, are taken are convicted wow. and only one is uh, actually sent to jail. And that's out, that's out of a thousand. And of the thousand, only like a third are reported. So that's really terrifying it's because also, that well, means this the, is happening on such a societal level. But isn't, isn't it the degree of assault too that they take into account? Like if it, now I'm not saying anything is okay, right? But I'm just saying people going, when you throw out these figures and you're saying that only a few of them are going to jail, I think maybe the more serious ones are actually going to jail, but one the other out one, of a thousand. I don't that know. Sound, that sounds well. What what constitute what constitutes someone going to jail for, over it? You know, that's another question that needs to be asked. I, I remember. So I remember yeah. when, I, when I first met someone that told me they were raped. Mm-hmm. It was like, like burdensome. Like it's heavy. Yeah. And what? I'm sorry. It's, burdensome. It, like burdensome. Like burdensome. like even though it. Uh, it, I, it happened like years. It happened years later, and it was I, I was having a conversation with this person, and you know she comes from like a, from a kind of, kind of Christian background, and for her it was like she was trying to save herself till marriage, mm. and then when that happened, she was like, "Well, um, that's how she lost her virginity. She was raped, wow. right?" Wow. So when um. I remember to tell him, and I remember it, it, it's like, it's, it's been some time now since I've heard this, 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 the story that I'm communicating. Uh, cause like, and then he's like, that's why later her other relation, later relationships, you know, when she, she was like, well, I'm not on the virgin anymore. So like, what's the point of like holding it? I, I might as well engage in those relate, even though I don't, I believe it's a sin still, right. but I've already like bad, bad, bad points. And, Mm-hmm. I, I, and she, like she did, like blame herself. He's like, I didn't fight back hard enough, or this mm-hmm. or that. And I was like, yeah, yeah, like, and I'm like, I can't, you know, like, no, you, you, at that point, I, I don't, like, I don't know how you can blame yourself for that scenario, right? And so many people do, like, even young children mm-hmm. who, you know, under the age of ten might even get sexually assaulted, and they'll still blame themselves. They'll feel that sense of shame and that taboo and feel like if I tell someone, I'm going to be the one that gets in trouble for this because I was part of it, you yeah. know, and in some cases forced by the rapist or by the sexual abuser to do something. Yeah. Therefore, the blame is on me. Right. And that's why I think that Me Too campaign is so important in bringing this about. And um, a colleague of mine, he actually uh, made this uh, longer Facebook post of, you know, as maybe average men, average Muslim men who are not 
you know, God forbid, participating in any of the sexual assault, but as bystanders, yeah. you know, how can we change this culture and this behavior to where it's not acceptable? And that well, includes just being men of integrity that don't my, overlook it when it happens. Yeah, my smaller. daughter was just talking about it today. Like she was telling me yeah. about kids on her bus talking about um, women's private parts and things like that. And I'm like, oh, yeah. well, what did you do when you heard it? And she said, you know, I just... uh I was just quiet about it and I didn't say anything. I'm like, you need to stand up and tell those boys to shut their mouth. And that's not very appropriate what they were talking about. And, you know, uh, get, get someone, uh, involved, like, uh, what's on the bus. So try to get the, the bus driver or somebody in, in authority in, of, involved so that you don't have, you should not be uh, subject to any of that kind of, uh, dialogue. You, you should know, like, you should uh, hold your integrity. You should keep your integrity valuable, right? I mean, you shouldn't allow anyone to, whether it's, forget about even touching, right? Even like verbal communication can be uh, really damaging on a psychological level when, especially at these formative years when they're in school and you, these shouldn't be tolerated right then if you well, cut this like... because we're in a society where we're supposed to be accepting of a lot of sex open sexuality right and it seems like we're all if we try to suppress it we're, we're or we're deemed as conservative people who are religious and we're we're trying to keep everyone back and hold, hold people a whole society from progressing well, I, I mean, I th I think people who women who have been like let's say non-Muslim women who have been sexually assaulted when they meet a Muslim man who understands the bounds of Sharia, for example, like th th this girl I this girl I knew, she knew I like didn't shake her, I didn't shake her hand or any, no physical contact at all, right? Yeah. And I explained that to her, and then she found that very respectful yeah. because mm -hmm. she was like, "Where you can cross the bounds." But it's funny, like Summer is right in that met. I have heard guys say that sexual assault or harassment doesn't count if it happens at Hajj or like India or Pakistan because it's it's the normative there. Well, see, so I I've heard like, that. So I'm like, what? Like, how's it's the same? It's the same person, right? Look, the, right? the the thing that men can do in this scenario to change and shift this culture is that whenever something like that happens on the bus, like she is subject to that harassment, she does not carry the responsibility to stop it, right? But as a person that knows about it as a man that knows about it for men to step up and to say yeah. this is wrong well, you know okay, when well, i was in high school oh, wait, wait, let me stop you there i know that that sounds great but as a father what would you tell me to do well so i was going to uh, share yeah. that like in high school um someone grabbed me inappropriately and I was in full hijab. I mean, not that my clothing matters, but I was in full hijab and I was wearing long clothing. There was absolutely no reason as I was walking by for this person to grab me. And when I brought this to the attention of the school, the school was just like, oh, well, you know, is that really that big of a deal? Okay. So they didn't oh. think it was that big of a deal. And when I told, you know, other members of the family, men did not step up. To say, look, this happened to, you know, a female family member. We're not going to stand for it or we dislike it. Right. And as for you, I would really say to talk to the school district, talk to the school and say, look, this is happening on the bus or even it can even be an email. But for men to step up and say, hey, we are men of integrity. Therefore, not only do we not say bad things about women, but we also don't like other men to say bad things about women. We don't like women being objectified in our presence, right? Imagine if a guy was here cheering on the Patriots or something else and some team that you guys didn't like. That person would be ostracized. That person would be an outsider and that person would not be part of your in crowd. And mm -hmm. I feel like that's a power that men do have that if you make it yeah. an an unacceptable thing for a guy to be talking about women's body parts or objectifying a woman how she looks, <laughs> you can make that man feel ashamed for doing those kinds of things, you know? And that's a power that, you know, unfortunately, as much as a girl might go up to him and say, hey, don't do that, it's just going to, it's it, that power dynamic is going to be really important coming from men stepping up and saying, we are men of integrity and we won't accept that. 
Yeah, I completely agree. I think that is the man's job. And more than likely, if a girl were to step up to the boys and say that, they would laugh at her. They'd probably start making fun of her. I mean, as you said, just that power dynamic in that situation, the girl does not have a lot of power. So I think that it is important for men to realize that there are some situations where you can handle it better. And unfortunately, I think that even the men who are very anti-feminist, they're not necessarily stepping up as men. So they complain about women who want to take over or be powerful or be equal to men, but they don't actually just step up as leaders and and remain the uh, the guardians of, of women. And there are so many circumstances where women still need that. So I think that this, this campaign, as, uh, I don't know how powerful it's going to be. Obviously, this is still social media, so Allah Alam, it may not lead to anything. But I think that in real life, just as Samar said, there have to be men who say, this talking about women like this is just inappropriate. We're not going to be around for those kinds of conversations. Um, there was one thing, just a bit of practical advice that, that my sheikh had said. He said, uh, if someone, he was advising me about backbiting and he said, if someone starts backbiting, either leave the conversation or say that I don't engage in backbiting. Like just simply, like that's not the kind of person that I am. And I think if we did have more men who stood up and said, look, this is wrong in, in all male spaces, not in front of women, not to show up to women, but in male spaces, if right. that's what men really believe, they have to do it around men. And I think we'd see a lot less of this kind of activity happening. On that note, because it's so, on social media, so yeah. you bring up an important, you, I, I can't not talk about white knights. You, you know what okay. I mean by a white knight? Yeah, I think so. Okay, I'll and describe it. Like stands out for a feminist. I mean, okay. it, it, I, I guess that's it, it's someone who's, who's always chiming in and being like that, almost that negative, that contrarian well, he, negative he's, Nancy. He's, being, he's engaging in self-flagellation, right? You know that okay. that practice that uh, a lot of Catholics do, where they're whipping their back over uh-huh. the sins that they do. Okay, that yes, they did. Yes. So <laughs> that they're they're yeah. so upset about. What, how men are treating themselves or treating women that they consider themselves, uh, rapists, even though they might Correct. be the nicest guy in the world. They literally use the word rape that I'm sorry to have raped you. Yeah. Extremist. Oh, God. So, I mean, yeah, so is, with that being said, really, sorry. I yeah. feel like what's damn, what I th- oh. like, so this week as I'm watching what's, who comments social media, so like, um, like, like, uh, oh, Summer and I, uh, we know Ismail, Ismail from Fawake. So he, he actually made a great, I liked his post. It's called hashtag I'm sorry, right? Mm-hmm. But Ismail doesn't like post random like views all the time. So mm-hmm. him posting that had a lot of weight with me. Whereas I saw other typical white knights that I knew were going to come and post something. And they're like mm-hmm. these four page, four paragraph essays. And to just add some context, Ismail's post wasn't just like, I'm sorry for all men everywhere that have ever done anything. It was uh, kind of action items. Like, okay, I will be more aware of the conversations that are going on. I will listen if someone tells me something is going on and things like that. So Yeah, so I I can appreciate that. But when you see people, and I think the conversation, the white knight destroys the intramale conversation because... When we when mm-hmm. when we talk when when the guys are just talking amongst themselves, um, you know you don't want to be you don't want to be perceived as agreeing with a white knight in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. Right. Otherwise, you just be shamed. Um, mm-hmm. and that's the that's just the reality too. I think, and I think the white knights coming into play, and and the thing is, the with the white knights, it's funny they feel, and, and the way we look at it is like some of them we know personally, they're not even married. And they think it's a way to get like women, but like it clearly hasn't worked for you, bro, because you're like in your 30s <laughs> and still single. <laughs> well, what's the Qawam movement like then? You know, like, okay, white knights are trying yeah, to be like Qawam, but what's the Qawam movement amongst Muslim guys? Can you explain what Qawam is for oh, the non Arabic? Qawam is like male masculinity and having leadership and integrity in your mm. role as a man in oh. whatever shape and form that you, you know. We'd end up in jail if we relied on our masculinity. <laughs> we're, we're biologically built to protect our, the honor of our woman, but unfortunately, uh, what society has made us, uh, 
uh, essentially castrated. I feel like the Kawam movement is also, what I see on social media, has been defined by feminists as well. So, like, mm. I think the the best angle that I've come across so far is that there's a lot of people trying. Um, I know uh, someone was, I ran into someone last night, Ustad Nur Adin, that, like, uh, there's a brother named Ideal Muslim Man. I actually don't know who he is. Um, I th- he mentioned that mm-hmm. you might be you might work with him in some capacity. I don't know too much about him. I know there's people out there trying, but the best uh conception of masculinity in the Muslim sense that I've come across is this concept of like fatua of chivalry. Mm-hmm. Um, that w- uh one of our previous guests, Rish Rashid Dar, he actually and I, we can maybe share this in the show notes at some point. There's actually an online PDF about how to be a chivalrous man mm-hmm. in the Muslim mm-hmm. context. That's devo- that's free of like these other perceptions. Um, unfortunately, in the in the greater society, because still, when we go to work, I I work at a, I work at a steel mill. It's a good old boys club. In some ways, it's a safe space because we can talk about some stuff. That I can talk about anything I want, really, li- literally there, right? But at the same time, it's like you know, there's you're probably working with. You're, I, I'm sure there's probably pedophiles there and like random sexual harassers and. All kinds of comments yeah. being made left and right that I, I can't share right now. But, uh, uh you know, it, like we have to interact with this greater culture that's, th- that's there. So that, that's the challenge. I would say, uh, I, I think it's fair that we should like make an effort, but at the same time, it's not overnight. It's not going to happen overnight. Uh, these white nights ain't going away. Social media has just made things right. like it's been positive for the Me Too movement, but I think, um, when you let anybody like social media, anyone can get on there and say whatever they want, and then mm-hmm. they have a following. Then I, I, I think that just, you know, you, you, I don't think I don't know that you're making much traction. The best we can do is just like talk to our families, um, you know, one on one and right. kind of go from there. But with that being said, um, Jazakallah for coming on. Um, how can people find you on uh, social media? Um, you know, you, you know, a lot of yeah. You're posting everywhere. So you have, uh, you know, blog. You have your own blog, and I think there's articles that are publishing on various websites. Uh, mm-hmm. Where can we follow you? Yeah. So uh, my blog is by the fig and the olive dot com, um, and then you can basically find me all over social media at fig and olive blog. And if you, I'm sure on the show, you'll have my name. Also, if you just type my name in Google, then a couple articles will come up as well. Cool. Jazakal Khair, thank you so much for being on. It's been enlightening. Absolutely. Thank for our you. Listener, thank you. Paul. For our listeners out there, if you have any questions or comments, you can email us at themadmumlukes at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, uh, follow us on Twitter, we're on Instagram, leave us a five-star review. Um I really didn't want to emphasize that. I met a brother last night who was telling me, he's like, I mean, I love the content you guys are putting out. I'm telling my friends, I'm like, I'll do anything to help. I was like, I need, we need five star reviews on iTunes because that's what really gets us, um, noticed in the, in the rankings. So, um, with that being said, I'd like to thank our special guest, Ustad of Nuruddin Knight and my co-host, Summer and Sim. This is Mahin signing off for the Mad Mamluks. Assalamualaikum. <laughs>